but they also have some staff that are paid that might be global asset events, events around the world. Um, shout out to New Zealand Day across the pond. Uh, we also run a meetup in Melbourne uh, called uh, uh, Melbourne Application Security. So we talk about a lot of different topics there, very similar to what you find here. Um, definitely join that if you're interested. We probably run them bi-monthly around about or whenever we can find good speakers. So just quickly, our goals for this event was to really foster, like, um, empower technology professionals to build secure applications. Um, so however you look at this, this could be the security professional really trying to scream and give advice to the development teams or product teams um, and not really getting anywhere. So that's kind of um, really why we want to make sure. And, and all the developers are just like, what the fuck's he doing? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just staring at him um, or her. Uh, and so really it's about getting out of our echo chamber um, in this kind of security world. So... Um, and the other one is obviously building a community of like-minded, passionate people. So I really hope you do a lot of networking today, meet a lot of new people. Um, it is very crowded, so we apologize for that. But there is two levels and there's a few rooms hidden away that um, you'll be able to find and kind of get some peace and quiet in. Um, there's also like an evac the, the evacuation point is probably like a little, it's like a little park outside the back stairs. So if you need some fresh air and it's not raining or anything, go ahead out there and, and relax for a bit if it gets too busy. Um, so to make sure we're, we're, on, we're on peace with our goals, I really want to get a show of hands of basically anyone who's not directly focused on security work full time. So if you can put your hand up if you aren't in a direct security role. And I'm going to get a photographer to take a really quick photo so I can do a count later on. Um, but that's a really, really good turnout. So it looks almost about 50% there, which is awesome. Um, a really quick mention to our Diamond and all these other different types of sponsors. So CBA have been with us for at least the last two years of running this event and they've been an amazing help. Obviously sponsors uh, make this event possible. I just want to quickly introduce Adam over here. Yeah, over here. Um, and this is just going to do a quick welcome. G'day guys and girls. I'll keep this short. Um, my name's Adam, I'm from the Commonwealth Bank, and uh, there's a bunch of us here, so say hi if you're seeing any of the guys here. Um, and we're here because this stuff matters. Um, what you do today, what you do back at work or at uni or in your spare time, this stuff is fun, it's interesting, but it can actually help make a difference, make Australia more secure. We see a lot of dodgy stuff happening, and we realise it's a problem, and we kind of all need to chip in to make Australia a little more secure. Um, we, that's why we're here. We love the community. We want to support it, want to back it. Um, what's really great about AppSec Day, um, we just saw it just then, it's not just the security folks, it's not just the devs, it's the security folks and the devs coming together to solve this problem. Um, so, yeah, it's all of us in the same room trying to solve that problem. You're awesome. This day is awesome. We love it. We love supporting it. Um, we'll be at the drinks tonight, so come say hi. We'll um, have a chat and uh, have a fun conference. Um, we obviously have quite a few more sponsors and they have booths outside, which I'll get to in a second, um, but I'll just quickly introduce uh, F5 to do a quick... G'day folks, Mike from F5. Uh, for those who don't know, F5, we make the world's best web application firewall. That lives in all... The best. <laughs> That lives in the old infrastructure days, I hear you say. We are all about secure coding. We all understand security deeply. Well, we are here to talk about how easy it is to integrate a WAF into your CI CD pipeline and make it very simple and get corporate policy across all your applications transparently to you, the devs. Come by our stand. Thanks, folks. Cool. Thank you. Um, as well as that, obviously, like a lot more sponsors, um, I know this part's a little bit boring for some people, but it really is important for us to thank them because they all contributed in their own uh, different ways, um, especially uh, Seek, where I work. Uh, I, <laughs> I, the amount of hours I've spent this year um, organising this event alone, my boss has been very, very um, helpful in that regard, I guess, <laughs> is, is the best way of putting it. So quick shout out to them. Um, 
the only other person I think was up for a talk is just my oven um, up there around. Otherwise, yep. Cool. Hi, everyone. I'm Orlando from MYOB. We are embarking on this beautiful journey of making security easy for everyone. We have three open roles that I want to announce. One is a senior SecOps engineer. We also have an application security engineer and a cybersecurity manager. We have a stand outside. Please come and have a chat with us if you're interested. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let me drop Mike, it's okay. Yeah. Um, but seriously, this is probably the best opportunity right now in the industry to move across if you are interested and you're a developer. Um, there is a lot of demand um, everywhere. So definitely go um, yeah, have a chat to them. Also, um, Hackers Helping Hackers. Who, who knows that, that crew? Yeah, they do some awesome stuff uh, with the community. So um, they're mulling around today as well. Um, go have a have a chat to them. They're a non for profit, um, doing some really cool things, trying to get students and new people into security as well. Um, so, uh, please say hi to our enthusiastic sponsors at the booths. Probably not as enthusiastic as this guy selling pizza, but uh, <laughs> we'll take passion where it comes. Um, so, you know, obviously they're they're going to be around upstairs and downstairs. Um, so go have <laughs> this gift gets funnier every time I watch it. <laughs> um, we've, we've entrusted your PII with yourselves, so your QR code has your data in it. Um, we did that so we don't have to trust that with a, a really random service. Um, so we're empowering you to be secure. If you don't want to do that, you can kind of cover it up, but the, the sponsors will probably ask if, if they can scan it. And after the event, don't just chuck it away or leave it on the ground if you don't want your email address lying around, basically. So. Um, <laughs> what was that? Yeah, exactly. Well, it's randomly generated, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, so we've got four tracks today. So we've got like a jam-packed day. It's going to be really hard for you guys to decide which talks to go to um, if you already haven't had a look. Um, we've obviously got the keynote with Keith this morning. Um, if it gets too busy, I think we're trying to stream it into another room as well. Um, I think we've got that sorted already. Um, so if you do want to sit down after this welcome, um, you can go into the bigger room, which is the, stream, the track two. So the track two is the second biggest room, um, which is basically on this level near where the coffee station was um, down there. So it's a little bit confusing to find your way around. There is signs on all the, the track doors now. Um, the lockpicking village will start up in about an hour or so. Um, that's on the top level in the middle of the, the room. It's labelled as well. Um, Topi will be demonstrating some of the workarounds for physical security so you can go and um, figure out why making security easy is an important thing so people don't bypass it. Um, then we have two talks, one after the other, and then a, a lunch break. So two talk streams, one after the other. So um, definitely make sure you figure out where the rooms are. Um, if you have any issues, you can just ask the staff about where the rooms are. But basically, there's two. The two big rooms are obviously here and down in level one across the way. Um, and then the other rooms are... Um, and there's a, a track four is also right next to track two. Um, and then track three is upstairs, um, right past the sponsor booths all the way at the end. Um, there's obviously going to be uh, a massive crowd for lunch. We're split up lunch on two levels. So please, if it's like too busy on one level, go and see downstairs if there's a, um, less busy. Um, so we've tried to cater for the crowds. And uh, lunch will be starting probably around 12, actually. Um, so if you are mulling around and you're not in any of the talks, go grab lunch before uh, the crowds arrive. And then we've got two more talks, uh, afternoon break, um, and then oh, two more talk streams, sorry. Um, and then obviously we have the security debate. That's actually really popular most years. So definitely feel like if you're keen to hang around for that, um, that's also Keith emceeing with some really awesome panellists. Um, that's always a bit of a laugh and, and really insightful as well. Um, we'll do a very short wrap-up if we have time and then straight to the after party.
So the after parties at Captain Melville and we've got free drinks and food provided there as well. So I'm hoping you guys will definitely not be going home hungry or thirsty. Um, so just a quick walk outside the door you came into, um, left and then around the corner. Um, maybe make a note of that now if you aren't good with directions. But we'll do another reminder at the um, after party as well. The rest area slash evacuation point is just out the back stairs. So if you go all the way down past stream two, um, down those stairs and outside, you'll see like a, a bit of a basketball court area with some chairs and stuff out there. In case of anything, an emergency or anything like that, um, definitely head out that way. Uh, and if you want to tweet or you want guest Wi-Fi, I would take a photo of this right now because this is not in many places. Um, so I'll leave this up for a few minutes. Um, really helps when you tweet things about the event, um, especially feedback and anything else. Um, we, we do appreciate a lot of feedback, um, either via appsecday.org, um, at oos.org, like email, which is on the website, um, or um, just tweeting about the event. It really helps. Everyone's got that? I think that's basically it in the end. Yeah. So I'm just going to introduce the, the keynote speaker now. Actually, hold on. Yeah, and just a reminder, if you do want a seat, there is plenty of room in stream two um, with a live stream. So we've got a webcam set up. It's actually pretty good quality. Um, so please feel free to do that. I apologize the room can't fit everyone in here. Um, it's probably a good problem to have too many security people. Um, <laughs> it's what the industry needs. So. Um, yeah, so definitely make your way down on this level at the back uh, where, that, where that coffee station was. It's a massive room with another 200 seats. Um, so, yeah, I'll introduce the, the keynote speaker. Um, actually, Pam, do you want to introduce the keynote? So welcome, everyone. I'll just make one short announcement again. If you are standing, please go to room two, zero, um, on this level, level two, room two, and we're live streaming in there. We can only have seated people in here. So I'd like to, what, big welcome to Keith, who just flew in from America, express from the US, as we say. <laughs> so does everyone listen to the Application Security Weekly podcast on the Paul Security Weekly Network? So this is the host. Um, Show. Oh, we're good, we're good. Is this a lapel mic? So you can use a lapel. Cool. And it also picks you up if you speak into it. Can you? Can you guys hear me okay with this? Is it still? All right, cool. I just want to make sure it was actually picking up. Um, Anybody? So I, I do kind of want to take a selfie with you guys, if that's okay. Uh, so if you don't want to be in it, just cover your face or something. Um, this is actually the biggest room that I've ever filled, and now I'm filling a second room. So uh, this is kind of cool. It's my first time giving a keynote, so it's like, holy crap. Uh, so we'll do a selfie. Hold on, we'll do a, got to do this wide shot. We well, have this corner too, hold on. Gonna... All right. Cool. Thank you, guys. Um, so I built this talk mostly around uh, the, the security side of things, but I, I know there are a number of developers. So uh, you're going to be able to help your security colleagues with a lot of this stuff as well. Um, so again, feel free to kind of take that angle when I talk about certain things. Uh, but to get started first, I just want to thank everybody for coming because, uh, I mean, traveling from America to come speak at a conference, I was like, OK, uh, Pam reached, reached out to me on, on Twitter and said, Keith, would you be interested in, in giving a talk at our conference? And I was like, cool, where, where is it? And I was like, Melbourne, Australia, okay. So I text my wife immediately. I'm like, hey, you want to go to Melbourne in October? And she's like, you mean like Australia? Uh, and I was like, yeah. And she's like, yes, sign me up. So um, also thanks to my wife, who, of course, shares my time to be able to go and do things like this. So Sarah, my wife in the front row, thank you um, for that. Uh, so also thank you to the organizers of the conference. This is pretty incredible to see just how many people are here, especially all the developers. Um, it's very rare to see that, and so I'm actually really excited uh, to, to have kind of that, that mix. Uh, of course, again, shout out to Pam and to Julian for all of their support, answering all of my questions and my emails, uh, all of the logistics of this. It's, uh, it means a lot. 
Um, so before we get started, also I've put uh, and my hacks as my Twitter handle if you want to hit me up on Twitter. Of course, OS Melbourne and AppSec Day if you want to continue the conversation there. Um, happy to also answer any questions later on. Uh, you can just DM me directly. I have open DMs. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, real quick, so I know we're strapped for time, I just want to breeze through this a little bit. Obviously, I'm Keith Hoodlid, uh, per uh, Pam's introduction. If I wasn't, that'd be a little weird. Um, I work for a company called Thermo Fisher Scientific, where I'm actually the manager of development security operations. So I actually run the red team and all of the AppSec uh, practices inside of Thermo Fisher. Uh, if you've ever been to a hospital or on an ambulance or even had medication of some kind, we make just about everything you could possibly imagine in the lab sciences, medical sciences field. So gels that go into a Petri dish, pipettes that do all the stuff into those Petri dishes, and uh, up to, you know, like CAT scan machines and all of that good stuff. So we do everything medical. And as you can imagine, we face everything from uh, internal, you know, insider threats, because we have 70,000 people inside of the company. So that's something we have to focus on or, or care about. Uh, random crimeware gangs, because everybody wants to make money these days. Uh, and then, of course, actual state actors, because we sell to forensics labs around the world. Um, so we, we face all different kinds of threats. Uh, so a little bit about me, just really quick. Uh, as Pam mentioned, I do run the Application Security Weekly podcast with Paul Asadorian. Uh, so that's a, a weekly podcast all about AppSec and development. Uh, in my free time, I'm also a hacker on BugCrowd. I'm uh, just recently at the top 100. It's been a lot of fun so far with them. Uh, also, I've kind of refounded the InfoSec Mentors Project. It existed between 2009 and 2012, run by Wim Reams and Marissa Fagan. Uh, in 2016, Jimmy Vo and I decided, hey, that kind of died out, and we really should bring that back. So InfoSecMentors.net is something we spun up. It helps you connect people uh, you know, together when it comes to either giving or receiving mentorship. So there's that if you want to check it out. And of course, uh, as a hobby, I'm a full stack developer. Of course, the who am I would not actually respond with this because bash versus JavaScript. Um, but that's uh, a little bit of kind of my nerdiness right there. So uh, with that DevSecOps, right, how did we get here? Um, so I wrote this talk initially a little bit kind of bashing on the term. For those that have listened to the podcast, I've said it's, it's just DevOps. Like, it's not DevSecOps. I don't know what you're talking about. This is a little weird. Uh, but then I actually started having conversations uh, with people in the space, James Wicked at Signal Sciences and others that I'm, I'm friends with. And I started to realize, and ironically, my title is effectively manager of DevSecOps. So it's kind of like, uh, bashing on this doesn't make too much sense now. Um, that using the term, especially inside of the businesses or enterprise today, makes a lot of sense because people are like, hey, wait a minute, what's that? And what do you mean? And what are you trying to get at? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, so from that, uh, for, of course, uh, it got into this whole idea of what DevOps versus DevSecOps. I, I want to talk a little bit about how we got to the term to start, because I think that's important to know where did it come from, uh, as well as the fact that uh, you know there, a lot of things have kind of happened to it. Uh, vendors have got their hands onto it and are doing certain things with it. Uh, of course, security professionals are talking about it in different ways. Developers are, are thinking about it as well in terms of the ways that they integrate with that process. Uh, and in some ways, it's actually hurting our image. And I think that we have an opportunity to change that um, with some of those things that I've included in here today. So um, with that, uh, first, this is Patrick Dubois. So he coined the term DevOps back in 2009 uh, with the first ever DevOps Days conference. So for those in the security space, it's similar to the B-Sides conferences, but for developers. So they talk about things like shared learnings or tools and knowledge. Uh, and of course, how to develop better inside of an organization, right? How to develop faster, release to production sooner, and so forth. Uh, he's currently the CTO at a company called Zender TV. Uh, and then there are these three individuals who, in 2010, from left to right, that's Josh Corman, uh, founder of the I Am the Cavalry movement with Bo Woods, uh, David Rice in the middle, uh, author of Geekonomics and previously at Apple, and Jeff Williams, founder of Contrast Security and the OWASP chair from 2003 to 2011, uh, in 2010, they came up with this idea called the Rugged Software Movement. And that was given at a SANS conference uh, related to AppSec. So for the whole idea of the Rugged Software Movement, it really was a, a call to action, right? They said, our code is going to be attacked, and it's up to us to build more secure software. We need to be proactive about uh, writing so secure code. And of course, all that insecure code that we release to production is going to be attacked by someone somewhere, whether that's a state actor, whether that's a crimeware gang, whether that's kids uh, getting cheeky on the internet. Um, but it, ultimately, it can compromise our business and it can also compromise our customers, so we have to care about it and we should start now. And that, that was back in 2010, so about eight years ago. And then in 2012, Shannon Leitz, who's the director of DevSecOps at Intuit, uh, came up with this whole idea of DevSecOps. 
Uh, so that's devsecops.org uh, is where she actually released this, the DevSecOps manifesto. So one of the things that she called out right at the very beginning of the manifesto is that we actually need to listen to our colleagues. And as security professionals, that means listening to our developer colleagues and our operations colleagues. Instead of being the voice of no, we have that kind of bad rap of saying, no, sorry, you can't release that to production because that's super vulnerable, uh, rather than trying to find a mitigation, for example. We've been viewed as inhibitors to the business and a cost center, right? We are simply, even though we're, we're the, the guards at the gates, as it were, um, we're seen as being an expense to the business. And of course, we do sometimes slow down delivering value to the customers because we stop a feature from being released that they're really asking for. And we exist, of course, in some people's minds to check a box, which is unfortunate. But she also called out that we need to build functional and reliable tools. Security as a service is a very real thing that we need to get on board with, and it's the only way that we scale as security professionals. Uh, in a lot of places, as I mean, we heard that there are folks hiring here today, there are less security professionals than are you know, potentially able to fill the jobs globally, um, especially back where I am in the States. And so to do that, uh, we need to, of course, scale and build services that allow other teams to make use of the tools that we're procuring or we're building ourselves. Uh, and then, of course, uh, from that, it needs to be consumable, because if you build a tool and nobody knows how to use it, well, it's you know, going to sit on a shelf or it's never going to get touched. But the most important part of that is, of course, to provide faster feedback to developers. Ultimately, that's the real goal of DevSecOps, is to give them feedback sooner in the process of development so that they can continue to move forward without being slowed down by someone like ourselves. Uh, and then, of course, we have to share what we learn. So people don't correlate news to personal experience in a lot of times. Uh, we see it often with uh, you know, major breaches that happen across the globe. And family members and friends don't really understand what we do. I mean, I go to a family gathering of some kind, and say, oh, what do you do? I manage development security operations. Well, what is that? And it just goes downhill from there. So, um, and of course, most of the time, developers, I, I think that this is perhaps a, a different case with this crowd, but most of the time, the developers in a large enterprise where I work don't understand what I do. Uh, so there's an opportunity to share knowledge and, of course, make security real for them by explaining exactly how that threat impacts your company or your business or impacts your family members, for example. And then, of course, uh, certain security vendors got a hold of it. And they thought, hey, there's this whole DevOps movement, and the CIO's budget is a lot bigger than security's budget, so maybe we can get in on that. Uh, and in some ways, they've bastardized the term DevSecOps in ways that can be detrimental to us as security team members. Uh, so, of course, it needs to be an integral piece to developing new code, but they took it a little far. So, of course, whether it's a startup or a seasoned company, uh, of course, or those that are perhaps, you know, for trying to provide a competitive edge, or those that are getting acquired or doing the acquiring, all of them are talking about DevSecOps. And RSA wanted to get on the action, and of course then RSA Lite, I mean Black Hat, uh, wanted to also do the same. So they're, they're trying to use this whole DevSecOps term to go ahead and, and get uh, businesses to spend more money on their tools, to try and get security to do more things like you know create more tickets. Uh, without really thinking about what it means to do DevSecOps or what it means for us as security professionals to really deliver on the values of DevSecOps. I mean, how hard could it really be? All you need is just more tools, uh, and you can't do DevSecOps without them. So just plug in as many of those tools as possible in that pipeline, generate as much automatic feedback as you can, and eliminate that human element as much as possible because there aren't enough of you or us, in this case, for security professionals. It'll be easy, there is what they're trying to convince us. So spend more budget. Try to convince the CIO to you know, share a little bit of that extra money that they have for development. And of course, those vendors don't com say, don't communicate with your peers, just send them more tickets. Buy more tools. Plug into that pipeline and scale. In my mind, that's just messed up. It goes against the whole idea of DevSecOps. Because in this case, communicating right at the very beginning is the most important thing. We need to engage with our peers. We need to listen to them. We need to ask questions of them. And instead of, of course, being that voice of no. And Shannon also calls out that we have an over-reliance on tools directly in the manifesto. Now, exploit testing over automated scanners doesn't scale very well, but it does validate the vulnerabilities are real. And of course, scanners have a problem of generating false positives. Uh, and then, of course, it also trains our incident responders, because if you're doing a red-blue team exercise, they get a chance to really see what an attack looks like and respond to it. Uh, and then, of course, it doesn't kill goodwill with developers either, because if you're giving them real vulnerabilities as opposed to a bunch of scanner output, 
then you can maybe sit down and show them how that exploit actually works, and then they get an understanding of it. So you get a chance to teach them your lead hacking skills. You, instead of, of course, you know, going ahead and sending them a report, it builds a relationship with those individuals, and then it gets them on our side when it comes to doing things like automating. So it's important to get those you know, relationships started in a positive way, because otherwise they get strained very quickly. Uh, as a result of you know, buying into that DevSecOps vendor marketing uh, and shoving tickets into their backlog, that's just going to cause a lot of headaches for a lot of people. And of course, developers, to some degree, are angry. They're con we've been convinced by security marketing that all we need to do is create more tickets, but we've forgotten what DevOps, the, what this whole genesis is from, is actually about, which is communication, coordination, and collaboration, according to John Alspaugh. And they're calling us out on this, and it, not just years ago, I mean literally three months ago. They're pissed about DevSecOps. We haven't communicated it well, we haven't been talking to them about it, and we're putting tools into their workspace without really telling them. They don't want those tools, they don't understand them, and they might not care. So they're seeing through some of the, the language that we're being fed and realizing that we need to do this better. And they're realizing it on, on our behalf. Now, of course, they know that security has always been a part of DevOps. We're right in the DevOps handbook in part six, for example. It cites InfoSec luminaries like Josh Corman or James Wicked and talks about how security fits into that process. So we could provide meaningful telemetry back to development teams in case maybe that push of code actually broke something, or operations teams who maybe need to revert that code because it is breaking things. And we have an opportunity to make code safer sooner if we work together. So why does security in the DevOps world feel like this? <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, we're always cleaning up messes, right? It's uh, a new release, more vulnerabilities, uh, suddenly we're up all night on incident response. And why is it that we always see the problems in operations and production than the operations team? I mean, why are we to the keyboard first? So I have to ask, where do we go wrong? And in my mind, we missed, lessons from the, or we missed some of the lessons from the Agile movement. First, Agile is about communicating with one another. And as a security team, we generally don't. We need to be asking questions, talking through our problems, and being involved in the architecture pro uh, discussions early and often. It's also about being responsive. Uh, we're stuck in this whole idea of compliance, uh, where we can check boxes with rigor and say, yes, we did that PCI assessment, you're secure. Um, maybe not. And of course, we fail to be responsive to development needs as they're trying to put new processes into their, their pipelines or use new tools or languages. And we don't move fast enough to enable them. And because of this, we're actually inhibiting our ability to deliver value to the customer. We also missed out on a couple of principles, namely early and continuous delivery. Imagine a world where we had early and continuous security. That's what DevSecOps is intended to do. And we really missed the mark on this so far. Now, we've also failed to realize that it's up to us because we need to build environments that help developers thrive. We're supposed to be providing tools that help them get the job done while making an, a maintainable security posture within the organization a realization at scale. And we also failed to learn from the DevOps movement or the application of Agile to operations, like small batch sizes or fast flow, or even, in this case, development patterns, such as being able to extrapolate away or uh, abstract away from legacy systems. We've missed out on the simple elegance of the three ways of DevOps, which is fast flow, rapid feedback, and continuous learning. We have a real opportunity with DevSecOps, but we need to learn from the past in order to avoid mistakes that have been made before us, such as water scrum fall for those that are doing agile in the business, uh, or infrastructure updates and operations. So of course then it, the question is, well, where do we fit in this whole DevSecOps process? And often we're thrown right into the testing mechanism, right? That's our job. We're supposed to make sure that the code is secure. Um, and then, of course, we're not brought in for architectural reviews. We're not consulted on which protocols they want to use, such as SMB v1. Um, or, you know, in this case, we create a lot of friction with different teams because of that. And they have too many things in their backlog to deal with to begin with. So, of course, we're then sometimes put into this pre-release model where, hey, we need to release this new code, so we need to test it. Okay, but of course, again, a high point of friction. Usually we're given very little time to do this. The deadlines for releasing that code is on the developer side, and if we slow that down, we're hurting their ability to deliver bonuses, their salaries, their jobs, et cetera. 
Uh, and then from there, the other side of it is, of course, right before deployment, which then we piss off production because now they're waiting until a Saturday to push that new bit of code because less people are online because we took too long to deliver the security results back. So we create a lot of friction in both places. Uh, and so in this case, really, in my mind, we need to be included right about here, which is in every phase. Talking through the, the, plan the planning stuff, um, writing malicious user stories, coding malicious unit tests, and providing telemetry data back to development teams and operations teams. Now, I'm sure there are probably some of you thinking, well, what if we just keep plugging tools into the process and generating more tickets? Uh, what if things just get better? If you truly believe that, I have a uh, quadrant here uh, that's about 150,000 US uh, that'll answer all of your problems. I'm joking, I don't actually have such a magic quadrant, but uh, I'm, I'm serious about the fact that we need to turn this boat around. Uh, we have a real opportunity with DevSecOps and we just need to seize it. So where do we get started? First, I think that we need to understand developers' problems. For example, what language are they using? Maybe it's Java or .NET. Maybe they've got problems with serialization or connecting to the database. And of course, it's important to ask what languages would they rather be using? Oftentimes, developers have a side hustle of something that they're trying to learn, uh, and they want to do something new and different and fun, but they're stuck with these old languages that uh, may not work for the problems that they're trying to solve. And then, of course, there's the frameworks and libraries that they're using, or the package managers and commercial off-the-shelf software, which has tons of vulnerabilities in it. So trust me, there's no shortage of JavaScript frameworks either, uh, but we have our work cut out for us here. And we need to understand so that we can have developers where they're at, as opposed to trying to you know, make them come to us, we need to go to them. So we need to understand all of that in order to actually build security services that are consumable for both development teams and operations teams alike. And telemetry data that we generate, along with secure configuration guidelines that we can approve, will make that process faster and easier for everyone. And if we don't understand these things, solutions that lead to new problems that we build are going to now have this situation, which is, hey, we've built a thing, and it doesn't fit with what they're building, so now it doesn't work. Um, and this actually may harm our relationships in the long term because they feel like we're not listening to them or we're not asking the right questions. We also need to understand, of course, where colleagues are tracking their work, as well as the change requests that are made both within teams and across the organizations. And then, of course, from there, the process that is used to deploy the code to production. Who are the players? What are the steps? And what can we streamline and automate? And quite frankly, those processes can be quite complex. By understanding the complexities of the process, we have an opportunity to identify security injection points and streamline the process for efficiency. Because it's easy to get entangled uh, in the processes as they're being built or that you've been saddled with over time. And DevSecOps, we can pave new roads, find more efficient paths, and drive toward achieving shared goals. So up until now, we've been on the outside looking in. We've watched as other teams have adopted new practices and developed new processes without seeing the bigger picture. Or rather, they've, see, they've developed it without them seeing the bigger picture, whereas we have. We have a unique opportunity because where we sit in the business, we actually see all of it. Uh, we tend to see more than just the single features or systems that they're trying to stand up or deliver. And we actually get a chance to secure the whole organization for the most part, because again, there's not enough of us. So small team, big organization. Because of that visibility, we actually have an opportunity to remove bottlenecks, streamline those processes, remove unnecessary queues. For example, I'm bothered by ticket requests for scanning an application. Why not automate it? Why not automate all of it? That's the whole idea of DevSecOps. But again, you have to be talking about what they're doing to understand where you can automate. And if you've read the DevOps handbook, use the lessons that a lot of teams have overlooked. If you actually read it, read the whole thing. There are lessons for different teams for different reasons, but as security professionals, we sit everywhere. Therefore, we can use all of it. And as long as we apply those things, we can bring DevOps or DevSecOps to the business. Good examples, small batch sizes. Uh, a number of companies take on big new projects, millions of dollars spent, and they never stop to think about experimenting. Or in this case, figure out if that project is going to be successful or not with A-B testing. But if we do this with security, it allows us to build momentum. We have a small set of teams where we can refine that process for security and ensure that those teams are enjoying that process. And of course, if they're successful, well, this garners support for us and then, of course, other teams. It leads to enhancing and maintaining our budget. It delivers on the security promises that we've been making. So, I mean, realistically, what company is going to stop doing security if it is being used broadly, effectively, and efficiently, 
is actually being asked for by the development teams. I don't know a single one that would say, we're going to stop spending on security because they like what they're doing. From there, of course, we have to ask to be included. And if that means we need to understand our peers and get involved in that process. So first of all, we need to get visibility into the work that they do, and they need to get some visibility into the work that we do, while also understanding the pressure that they're facing. Uh, we're often a cause of stress for other teams, and we don't really understand why. So for our, the folks out here that are in development specifically, um, it's hard for security and a lot of other teams to actually understand the level of work that you're doing, because let's face it, uh, it's not physically tangible. It's not a widget, right? It's software. And at the same level, I think that security professionals, uh, a lot of teams don't understand what we do, and they don't understand the level of work that we do, because again, it's not visible. You can't see it. It's not a physical widget. So it's no wonder why developers will lose their cool. You know, we're throwing security tickets over the fence, and in all honesty, I've done that myself. So we have no idea what their development uh, workloads look like, and in the same way, automating ticket creation into Jira instances with security tools will burn up that goodwill. So to that regard, security vendors have failed us immensely. Meanwhile, we're freaking out. Developers aren't fixing security bugs. They don't understand how bad the vulnerabilities really are, and they lack proper context as to why they're bad to begin with. Technically accurate Jira tickets without context or sense of urgency leads to bugs not getting fixed, and it leads to everyone being stressed and burnt out. Our job as security professionals is stressful. We find vulnerabilities that we can't believe. For example, what do you mean you don't have session timeouts on your logins? You've got Apache Struts 2 talking to what? Where? Yeah, it, man, I've seen those things. It's not good. So, um, of course, it's compounded and complicated by the fact that there are so many vulnerabilities that we find, and that many teams just don't listen to us, so they just pile up. And of course, as software developers, I'm sure you've experienced that you're constantly getting hassled by product owners, or scrum masters, or release managers, or security professionals, and executives in the business. Where's that new feature? Of course, you just really want to write some code and release new features. And you're being bogged down by a lot of externalities. And as managers, our lives are stressful as well. Whether we're leading a development team or a security group or an operations team, we face a mountain of conflicting priorities on a daily basis. We keep teams focused on meeting specific goals, which leads to further conflict, because my goals, take Apache Struts 2 offline, might conflict with the development team's goals, which is release that new feature that uses Apache Struts 2. So uh, likewise with operations, can't patch that server because uptime. It's a nightmare. So thankfully, there are lessons from the DevOps movement to help us here. For example, making our work visible and to gain visibility into the work of others. So we need to know that problems exist to eliminate waste, automate those processes, and remove roadblocks. And that's exactly why we need this visibility, to help us identify the constraints and give us an opportunity to streamline others' workflows. Making work visible isn't really that hard. I mean, if you're co-located, you can use a simple whiteboard, for example. Or if you've got uh, you know, software in-house, you can use tracking tools like Jira or Trello or GitHub projects or other software as available. It doesn't need to be complex. It just needs to be shared across the team so that, of course, everybody sees what each other are doing. Operations in pushing patches, for example. Software development in use of new uh, architecture. And then, of course, development teams can run scans and receive results, and they know when those scans are being run and when they should expect to receive results because they know that they're in the board somewhere. So, of course, from there, we need to get some visibility uh, into things like the frameworks that they're using, the protocols that they're using, and so forth. But if we go and look at the work board, we can actually get an understanding as to what that is. If you want to learn more, there's a great book by Domenica de Grandis on optimizing workflow. I strongly recommend it for security managers as well as, of course, security engineers that are fed up with bugs not getting fixed and for development teams because, quite frankly, uh, it'll probably be useful to you to make your work visible to other teams just simply reaching out and providing them that access. So security people, go and talk to your development teams about asking to see their backlog, asking what they're currently working on, and ask to be involved. Developers, invite us because... Not everyone's an extrovert, uh, stands up in front of a crowd of you know, a couple hundred people and talks about these things, right? So invite us, right? Show us what you're doing, because it'll help us a lot. And as security professionals, ask to be included. Ask for, write, and consume documentation. Documentation is pretty often done badly, if it's done at all. Uh, if a feature behaves as intended, it doesn't need to be documented. Supposedly, developers can just write code, and all the problems will work themselves out. 
I mean, quite literally, this has been enshrined in the Agile Manifesto, and many developers that I know, at least in the large business side of the world, take that to heart. And it's full of crap. Not everyone is a developer. Not everyone can just read code and understand how it operates. Quite frankly, in all the development that I've done, sometimes I go back to code that I've written three months ago, and even I don't understand how it works. So documentation will help everybody involved there. And of course, uh, and in this case, how is anyone supposed to be able to understand it if the developer can't understand it, security professionals can't understand it, operations doesn't know how it works, and so if the server goes offline, everybody has to wake up. So the other side of this is, of course, that working features are not synonymous with secure features. Most often, working features are stuck together with some sort of bubblegum and tape and generally make it perilous for the organization because now you're throwing that into production and lobbing it over to the fence to the operations teams. This is why we have technical debt issues. We can't properly secure features we don't understand, and we can't understand features without documentation. So while there are some that say there are reasonable excuses for slacking off, they're dead wrong. If I go and ask for documentation and it looks like this, well, you've got a problem. But in this case, we can go ahead and fix that. If they're not writing documentation for some reason, it'll hinder our ability to deliver security services and prolong technical debt issues. And if you do have documentation, by the way, it probably looks like this. <laughs> it's not maintained, it's not kept up to date, it's probably missing critical details. And outside teams that try to work from this to provide solutions usually come up with some sort of kludge that just doesn't work. So now you've got wasted effort, you've probably burned some goodwill, and that's just not the truth in production, so it's gonna be a problem. Quite frankly, I'm guilty of this too. Uh, my excuse has typically been, my processes are changing too fast to sit down and document them. I've recently learned the errors of my ways because I've hired a, a new person onto my team and I've had to literally train them on all the things that I was done doing. Uh, it's taken me far longer than if I had simply documented that process. And worse, I have several new hires starting next month and I still haven't really built that documentation. So here we are. So my simple advice here is build the docs. Whether it's uh, talking to development teams and working with them to get them stood up, whether it's writing your own security documentation so you can share with developers and operations teams how you're doing that security process, it will help them understand your limitations. For example, problem scanning with a login prompt, for example. If you're running a scanner, it runs into the login prompt, fails because it can't get through the login prompt, maybe the development team has built some sort of session cookie that allows you to do that in staging and in QA. Problem solved. So at the end of the day, uh, it'll help you onboard new teams faster. It'll help you share that knowledge broadly so other teams can automate and use the tools that you're building. And lastly, you should put it in a centralized version control system. Track who changed what when. It makes it visible for the development teams and where they live. Speaking of which, of course, uh, we should ask to be included in the version control system. Because along with that documentation and ticketing systems, uh, we need to know what code is being worked on where and who's changing it. So if you're not familiar with Git, it's time to get started. Unlike previous version control systems, Git has been adopted broadly and deeply within the development community. And while it's not the easiest tool to learn, it can save you time and energy when addressing problems across the business. It brings you right to the source of the problem, all pun intended. <laughs> I'm glad you guys like my jokes, this is good. <laughs> so, for starters, operations teams have successfully leveraged infrastructure as code in their business. Replacing systems instead of patching them should be enticing to us, especially when done repeatedly, at scale, and secure. And there are less professionals who know how to code in the security space. We have a lot of opportunity to build libraries and functions that teams can be using with impunity across the organization. It can be useful to both small and large companies, such as input validation functions or output encoding libraries. These things can eliminate entire classes of bugs inside of the business. And quite frankly, developers could use that level of support because they don't necessarily know all the things that we're doing. And if you're looking for tools to get started or, or just to get familiar with, there's a SANS poster for that. And while there's a SANS poster for just about everything these days, this one is particularly good. It has a whole section on getting started in DevSecOps uh, culture and communication is right up front, believe it or not, and it's really useful for leadership inside of an organization. On the back page, it has a checklist for error handling, data protection, authentication, session management, and a whole slew of other problems that developers and security professionals face. It should be the very first link that you see on Google. 
not hard to find. So the whole idea, of course, is doing this continuous delivery thing. And to do that, we need to get involved in version control to start moving in that direction. The only thing missing on the cover of this book is security. We need to be able to ensure that businesses are providing reliable, secure software without a great deal of fanfare. And that's achieved by living in the code base with the development team. We, of course, need to know where the development and operations teams are in their workflows on the day to day. It will help us stave off inf uh, insecure infrastructure, as well as, of course, vulnerable frameworks and libraries that they're trying to introduce. It also gives us valuable historical context. We can identify entrenched behaviors so that we can go ahead and perhaps change them and build a more secure culture. Now, well, for some of us, it's fun to sit back and yell, hack the planet. It doesn't promote trust or respect that we need. We actually do need to be in the trenches with those development teams. Develop plans to address current and future security concerns. A great example is PHP 5.7. It goes end of life on December 31st of this year. More than 70% of the internet runs on it. We should have a plan for that. <laughs> it also helps us build a sense of camaraderie with our peers. And it generates mutual respect. So by living in the code base, it, we can help to identify where we can build in security as a, a service, basically. SaaS, as I like to say. Allowing us to streamline and do different testing processes. And we can gain a baseline for addressing security concerns at scale. If you're looking for a language, my recommendation is Python. It will help you fly through problems with various environments. And you should store it in a centralized version control system because it invites others to use our tools. It empowers others to perform security assessments without manual requests, and it enables others to build upon our work. Likewise, it's okay if you're not good at writing code. <laughs> These things take time and practice. Share your code in a centralized version control system, and professional software developers, our colleagues here today, can contribute. And you probably should have good naming conventions for your variables and your functions, and they'll probably tell you that. But it also enhances usability. So if you're interested in learning how to code a little bit better, Definitely recommend Bob Martin's book on clean code. It'll come in handy. And of course, then you might recommend it to developers joining your organization or those rock star developers who might be creating unnecessary friction in your environment. Lastly, we should have, of course, ask to improve the process. So once we've gained and provided visibility into the work that teams are doing, along with maintaining and consuming documentation and writing code to enable our developers to automate security checks, it's time to get involved in the process of changing the organization. Now, we've been that team that lobs grenades over the wall. We might experience reluctance when we ask to go ahead and change or improve those processes. But we're responsible, responsible for reaching out and offering to help them. We can reach out and extend support to those teams, start to change the way that people think about our work, and have a unique opportunity to shed light, especially on the problems that other teams are facing that appear in the news every day. So through shared data, we can make conceptual problems tangible reality. Actively attack code drives home the importance of the work that we do. And with development and operations teams understanding exactly how their code is being attacked, they might start to take what we're saying seriously. So if you find yourself with a fancy dashboard, it's time to scrub that data and make sure that it pays dividends by sharing it across the organization with operations and development teams accordingly. Telemetry as a leading indicator for bad code releases gives operations the air cover it needs to revert that code release back to the working version. And of course, we should also be honest with our colleagues about both our elite skills as well as our shortcomings. If we are having issues understanding new tools or solving complex configuration issues, or even maybe we're not very good at writing code, we should tell them because they're probably willing to help. And that's okay because not everyone's a rock star programmer. And if you're struggling with configuration management with Ansible, Chef, or Puppet, or perhaps the nuances of Docker or Kubernetes, ask them for help. There's probably some teammates in development that have got some sort of side hustle going on involving these tools, and they can teach you how they work. They'll probably be excited to teach you how they work. And that's the point of open, and, uh, open contribution and collaboration. If you're working to uh, you know, talk with your peers and be a little bit vulnerable with them, they tend to reciprocate. And I don't mean by installing Flash, by the way. Don't be vulnerable like that. Um, but of course, you can learn how to strengthen their shortcomings, and they can learn where to strengthen yours. You'll make connections with them, and you'll build a sense of trust with one another. And of course, as fun as it can be to go and set up scans and then fly some drones, many of us should be spending time at the whiteboard with our colleagues in development. We can talk about architectural problems that lead to security vulnerabilities. We can recommend new methods for addressing and talking about patching issues readily right in the process of development. 
or maybe even some unit tests that we can build for them. We can also talk about providing secure authentication mechanisms, such as public private key infrastructure that they might not have a lot of expertise on. And although I haven't met a parser tongue, giving, giving examples of how secure code should function for development teams is powerful. Your points resonate with them that much stronger if you can show them what the code should look like. And Python is a fairly readable language, so it might help you get your points across. And on the topic of learning new things, the OSCP is an incredibly valuable and impressive certification. I don't have it, but anyone that I meet that has it, I really like, I enjoy shaking their hand and being like, that's awesome. But it'll only take you so far as a security professional. There are several other courses to help you expand your horizons. Now, while they are paid opportunities, you can go ahead and get started on some of your DevSecOps engineering skill sets with the core set of SANS courses that are available. And of course, if you're working in Java or .NET, there are courses specifically for those as well for your business. And the virtual machine space itself is shrinking. Uh, they're now called containers. <laughs> so we need to keep pace with the needs of the business. And in order to do that, that means staying up to date on modern technologies. Our teams are probably already using containers today in our environment, whether or not we know it. And if you're unfamiliar with such technologies, it's definitely time to get started. Likewise, for those companies that are at the tip of the spear, serverless is coming. <laughs> It's one of those things that allows us to go ahead and actually provide security tooling that is consumable by development teams quickly and at scale. And it shores up the foundational mechanisms of input validation and output encoding, which is critical for developers today. So again, it's worth exploring further. Now, in some cases, we actually have the opportunity to drive the transformation within the organization. And if these are things that are being adopted, such as serverless or Docker, well, we have an opportunity now to get some more attention on that because businesses are starting to recognize the importance of maintaining, and in, in this case, growing a strong security program. And so we can go ahead and shape some of the ways that the business is operating. The board of directors is listening to us. We are getting larger budgets and headcount. With that power, we should seek to improve the lives of our colleagues in development and operations because they're likely saddled with technical debt or legacy systems that they no longer want to work with. So we can provide air cover for them to pay down those debts or migrate away from those systems. And of course, we have the data to back it up. So again, we have an opportunity to drive that change with development, security, and operations teams alike. For example, if you're using Threats 2, we've already witnessed a major breach at Equifax, and we've recently had another remote code execution flaw come available inside of the same framework. So it's time we talk to our development teams about moving off of Threats 2. Maybe we could suggest the Spring framework or Apache Spark. But there's an opportunity to move away from this, and if the team is using a legacy code base that they don't want to do this anymore, we can give them the air cover that they need. Same thing with jQuery and React. Again, if they're maintaining a legacy code base, there are frameworks out there that do security by default a lot better. So we can go ahead and help them migrate to that. And at the end of the day, developers usually understand that this is a problem. It's the product managers and executives who need time to understand that it's okay to move across to this new framework, it's okay to spend some time doing that because it will save them time in the long run. So we can get a, go ahead and move them to secure by default frameworks if we simply put the data behind it. Now, of course, you can also bring your teams along for the journey because if they're still using Subversion, well, I'm sure that they're probably you know, tearing their eyes out. Maybe we should go and buy a Git uh, repository of some kind and then offer that to them as a tool that they can also use or modern chat-based infrastructure, or chat ops as it's now called. Again, a lot of teams want to be using some of this, but they're stuck with other systems that are not helping them automate or giving them visibility. And by the way, this also helps you get that communication element going between development, security, and operations teams. And of course, there's the whole idea of being able to do testing at scale inside of the cloud. A lot of companies are afraid of it, but it allows us to move a little bit faster a little bit more secure, and a little bit more repeatable, so we have an opportunity to give them air cover and move them into modern infrastructure. We have the opportunity to throw around that excuse for security in a lot of different ways. So because we have that data to back up our reasoning, uh, we, should, we can and should go ahead and take those legacy systems and move them away from our environment or our organization as much as possible. We stand to gain a lot of credibility, and in this case, a lot of you know, major thumbs up and kudos from our development and operations teams by doing this. And if we actually look at some of the problems through a wider lens of inside of our business, uh, through DevSecOps, we can reshape the experience that security professionals and developers have in their business today. Simply put, we can be heroes. In communicating with our colleagues in development and operations, we can encourage the business to change in ways that benefit everyone. 
To do this, all we need to do is ask questions and truly listen to our colleagues. We can lead the transformation in the business by setting an example for other teams through modern infrastructure, for example. And although wearing a cape is optional, it might be fun. Also, by understanding the Agile and DevOps movements, along with problems that the businesses are experiencing today, we can evolve those security practices. If you haven't read The Phoenix Project, it's uh, basically a novel, so it's not an actual, like, you know, how-to book, about an IT manager who becomes manager of, uh, or VP of operations inside of a, a widget-making company. You'll probably laugh, cringe, maybe even cry a little bit because you've experienced all the same problems that he has. Uh, but again, opportunity to continuously learn and adopt some of those practices. Same thing with the DevOps handbook. You can then take all the applications of the Phoenix Project and then now uh, read about how they're actually done in real businesses. So when we combine the lessons of these books, we actually have an opportunity to begin injecting security into fast flow or rapid feedback and continuous learning methods, such as all the things we see in DevOps. And by providing things like secure libraries and functions, we enable teams to move faster by building security as a service. We can enable rapid feedback to development teams. And although uh, open in communication and collaboration uh, by discussing with those development and security operations teams, we can go ahead and share those lessons uh, learned throughout the business so that the mistakes can be avoided in the future, especially if we document them. So it's true that, again, historically companies have seen us as a cost center, and at the end of the day, we keep the business running in the face of adversity. We have an opportunity to become a central force for generating business value. Customers are looking at companies today to say, how are you doing security? How are you making sure that all of our data is being protected in the cloud? So again, communicating with our colleagues, we can understand how and where to put those mitigations to protect the business. We can take the big things like CVSS and put business context around them so that it's actually applicable to our business. And in sharing those tools and processes, we become one team. And at the end of the day, you can't win together if you don't work together. That's what it means to embrace DevSecOps. We can be heroes, and to do that, we need to understand what we're saving. So yes, we broke the build. It's up to us to fix it. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Um, we have about three minutes for questions, if anybody has yeah. any. I guess I have a question. Oh, uh, sure. Do you do um, separate security pipeline? Do you recommend that, or would you? Dep um, so, still on. So, uh, yeah, it actually is, um, depending on the tooling that you're using, yes. So, uh, pipelines for security is static analysis, super slow. Separate pipeline makes a lot of sense because it takes time. Um, dynamic analysis, depending on the scanner itself, yes, sometimes. Um, yeah. Okay, perfect. So, cool. Thank you. Um, I'll just make... Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll just make an announcement. So we have two more talks before lunch.